Thank you for that reminder. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the STG Global Internet Law and Policy Foundry webinar discussing the, uh, showcasing the results from the Internet Law and Policy Hackathon that happened this last fall. Uh, the first policy hackathon, which was titled the Internet Law and Policy Foundry Hackathon, Addressing Disparities in Access to the Internet, was hosted virtually on November 20th to 22nd of last year, was open to students and young professionals around the world of all backgrounds interested in internet policy. The participants were asked to address how the digital divide disproportionately impacts communities of color and other marginalized groups who often lack reliable and affordable access to the internet, an issue that has been compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic. Participants were asked to suggest solutions to addressing this disparity. Um, so we'll go ahead and introduce the panelists. So um, I'm the moderator. My name is Lauren Harriman. I'm a fellow with the Internet Law and Policy Foundry, um, but I was also part of the committee that put together the hackathon. So I'm really excited to talk more about kind of what came out of the hackathon. Um, I'm going to have the participants uh, introduce themselves, starting with Team 7. Hi, I'm Sam Crystal. And uh, I'm Justin Cook. And then team five. Hi, I'm Noah Abdelbeki from Cairo, Egypt. Hi, I'm Jessica G. And then team eight. Hi, I'm Anya Mahal. Hi, I'm Lala Mohammed. So thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Um, it's early, especially early for me because I'm on Pacific time, <laughs> but it's really nice to see you all here. Uh, so we were going to do some polling originally, uh, but such is the world of COVID with tech issues. Um, but I am, I guess, see, I guess one person has maybe joined. Um, I was just going to generally ask uh, whether people have internet broadband at home, um, whether people have been working from home during the pandemic, whether this issue is kind of otherwise directly impacted folks. Um, but maybe we can just kind of have those out there sort of themes for people to be thinking about as we talk about these solutions. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. So team seven was our winner of the hackathon. Um, so I'm gonna have you guys go first. Um, let's just start with what drew you to technology policy in the first place. Oh. Well, uh, I guess I'll go first. So, um, yeah, I actually, I had a little bit of, um, I, I worked for the state government here in Georgia for a little bit and uh, there got the chance to work on the science and technology committee. And, you know, they, uh, you just, you know, that's um, it's a growing world right now. With uh, in between trying to um, deal with issues of cybersecurity, trying to increase internet access, um, rural access has been a pretty big issue in our state. And um, so it just, uh, I don't just got enough exposure to it that I wanted to uh, get into it more. I guess. Great. And uh, Sam, did you want to make a comment at all on that as well? Kind of what drew you to tech policy? Yeah, sure. Um, so my background is mostly in uh, social science, particularly psychology. Um, I sort of came into the technology policy regulation realm through my graduate program, Interactive Telecommunications. Um, so I'm technically by trade a public interest technologist, not necessarily a policymaker. Um, but in the like principles of technology design, my attention has really shifted to the absence of protections for user privacy and security on different devices and uh, the inequality that exists in the distribution of network systems and the sort of lack of access that comes from. Very interesting. Um, and so can you tell me specifically what drew you guys to the technology policy hackathon? This was our inaugural hackathon. It was a virtual hackathon. Um, I'm also just uh, 
personally interested as you know, a member of the committee that put it all together, uh, kind of what drew each of you to get involved in the hackathon itself? Well, for me, it was actually just uh, heard about y'all from word of mouth. I uh, just, uh, you know, it's always good to be able to keep up with what everyone's saying. So uh, I, um, when I started getting interested, I pretty much went down the list of every organization I could, I could find to see what everyone's saying about technology policy. And so uh, I, uh, I was lucky enough to be able to start learning about Child's Group when this, uh, this hackathon start, came up. So. That's awesome. And Sam, what drew you? <laughs> um, so I, I, I believe I found out about y'all through one of the various tech policy email lists that I follow. Um, there are a few. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, I was, I was really looking to uh, just try and test out my policy writing chops. Um, like I said, I don't really come from a policy writing background. I started to shift my coursework into that arena. So I just wanted to see um, what I could do. That's awesome. And we're so glad, of course, that you guys joined and came up with this just really awesome solution. Um, can you go ahead and just sort of briefly explain your solution? Um, I might, I'm not sure I can do visual. So I guess I think it's just going to have to be a, a words thing. Um, either of you can start or if you want to kind of tag team it, uh, it's up to you. Uh, well, Sam, I will, uh, I don't know if you want to start. I will gladly say that you are the brains of this operation. Um, I, uh, see, so yeah, essentially, um, what we were, when we, when we got the uh, project uh, prompt on um, trying to help with internet access, you know, our first reaction was, uh, oh my, this is a, such a huge issue. How, you know, this is something that so many people have been trying to tackle, how to handle handle this. And uh, so the, uh, um, the idea of using a um, base, Basically, a um, you know, with the with the mesh networks, choosing a, a single city to be able to um, test how that can be done, both with um, getting cooperation between the uh, the community, the uh, getting um, indiv individuals involved to be able to uh, maintain this network. So essentially, the um, the way that the project works is the trying to give everybody within the uh, city of New Haven access to um, internet through the uh, the mesh network that um, would be installed in different areas and the, the hub of that would be through the uh, net network that already exists for people to get internet access through uh, um, basically the uh, the local university's uh, um, library system and uh, any other system that um, might be available. There's already a couple of um, um, funding mechanisms for for that through the um, through the university. So we're hoping to kind of tie into that in order to pay for this, be able to pay for, um, be able to get uh, just the computers and other equipment necessary in order to make this work. Um, so there's, a, you know, there's, um, oh, it's really exciting. No, 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 no. Um, I, yeah, go ahead and jump in, Sam. You got, a, got some comments to make. I oh. especially would love to hear, I noticed on your one pager that you straight up cite the IEEE and uh, as an electronic engineer myself, uh, that, that was intriguing to me. So feel free to touch on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, as Justin mentioned, uh, one of the key facets of our plan, uh, so, so I'll, I'll start off by saying there were really three prompts that we took in approaching the digital divide. There were really three key problems. 
the first is broadband provision, um, how we get internet into the home, hardware provision, how people can actually access that internet once it's distributed. And the third one is uh, commonly overlooked and that's uh, basically bridging, forget the exact, yeah, uh, getting people out from behind the digital learning curve. So it's very common that uh, people who don't have access to the internet don't necessarily know how to use it. Um, and so in the prompt, a uh, key thing that we latched onto was the idea that we wanted a community-centered solution. And so um, mesh networks are a technology that really afford that. Uh, mesh networks, for those who don't really know, uh, basically you have one hub, one internet service provider. In our case, this would be local libraries or public schools that are subsidized by the federal E-rate program of the Universal Service Fund at large. Um, and uh, the way mesh networks work is they effectively distribute uh, that internet uh, service, that broadband, throughout different nodes. Uh, and they, these, these nodes, which are routers, just like the ones that are in your home, uh, receive that information, transmit that information throughout a network. <laughs> Um, and the important point about this is that it is low cost and easy to scale. And so, you know, again, addressing the COVID-19 pandemic dimension to that, um, the digital divide has really, uh, the disparate impact of the digital divide has been a problem that really demands a, a quick and easy to scale solution. And so that's really why we sort of went for this technology. You know, when it comes to bridging the digital divide, personally, I'm relatively tech agnostic, but, um, you know, again, mesh networks are affordable, easy to scale, community oriented. They really check the boxes for, you know, broadband provision here. And just, I think you guys did mention it briefly, um, but just for, you know, recording purposes and for the audience down the line, um, do you guys have a rough idea of what the cost of your solution is and who would be paying that cost? Yeah, um, so on the broadband provision side, it's sort of difficult to quantify that. The Universal Service Fund is not very transparent about uh, how each case of where it provides internet to schools and uh, public uh, schools and libraries, like what the cost for those individual use cases are. But at least on the hardware side, um, as someone who's volunteered for NYC Mesh, which is a a uh, local non-for-profit that implants mesh networks. Uh, it costs approximately $209 per installation per home, and that cost would be covered by uh, the municipality, uh, in this case, New Haven. Um, and I sort of talk about how they're currently undergoing their own initiative to bridge the digital divide, and the funds that they've set aside for that would really be put towards um, the, the broadband hardware. And so um, approximately, if, if we take into account that there are uh, 56,102 housing units in New Haven. Uh, that ends up being about $16,269,580. Um, now, that sounds like a big number but to the Chattanooga Fiber Project. They had an operating budget of $661.5 million. And that was after partnering with the local utility stakeholder, which covered a sizable amount of the cost and actually lowered costs by allowing engineers to work off of their existing infrastructure. And you know, that $16 million, that's 2.4% of the Chattanooga wow. operating budget. And again, it's faster to implement. Um, so, you know. <laughs> It's, it's important that we develop these fiber optic networks to deal with internet backhaul as a part of the digital divide solution. But if we're talking about community oriented solutions that deal with the, the disparate impact during the COVID pandemic, this is really the kind of option that we need to be pursuing. And are you two um, interested in executing your plan or are you looking to you know, have the solution be taken on by folks that are actively working to solve these issues already? Um, so th there are sort of two elements to this. Uh, in, in the internet provision side, um, we would ha really have to talk to Congress about restructuring the Universal Service Fund. And unfortunately, those conversations that are be ha being had right now, uh, the kinds of restructuring that are being proposed are largely influenced by lobbying efforts by AT&T and Verizon. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, the Universal Service Fund is subsidized by taxes on individual calls. Um, so if you look at your phone bill, you actually see 
uh, <laughs> like a universal service fund. They have an operating budget of about $8 billion, um, give or take, uh, depends on the year. Um, and they're actually calling for it to be completely dissolved, which would not be great um, because they provide a really essential service, like you know, um, subsidizing rural uh, internet access, low income access, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I actually uh, fleshed out this idea for a class that I took as part of my graduate program for the Center for Urban Science and Progress at NYU and ended up uh, bringing this to the chief for New Haven's Digital Divide Initiative. Um, and they like the idea, you know, who doesn't like the idea of bridging the digital divide, but um, they are more interested in providing a fiber optic approach, which, you know, again, is very expensive, is, is quite time intensive. And the way that they were talking about it, the focus is less about putting fiber initially into low income, low, low access on and more about providing it to whoever uh, helps to pay for this initiative, which to me is a huge problem. I think I succeeded finally at sharing your one pager. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you guys are able to see it. Yeah, if I can, if I can add to that, uh, one of the of one of the issues as well with the with this that hopefully can be overcome with enough uh, time and effort. Is that, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of legal hurdles even to being able to do these uh, national networks. I know there's a couple of states that have uh, made laws that are antagonistic towards it, and part of that is um, because of the well, I mean, it, it it cuts into um, bottom line for some of these. Um, providers of broadband, which I understand that that's some. So uh, one of the issues in to overcome with this in the future is finding a way to make those uh, companies part of the solution. And, um, you know, that's part of why we chose one city is because we really thought that if we had the ability to show, hey, this, this is working, let's, if we can start building the momentum, then we can start making it grow, start showing that this can be uh, success for uh, both the communities and for uh, local leaders and uh, really drive up living conditions for, for everybody. So it's, um, you know, there's a reason why we have this incremental approach. It's because um, we need this momentum to, to start somewhere. Absolutely. But yeah, um, so we do have to move on shortly to the next team, but I do uh, just one, one final question. If nothing else, what do you hope the audience remembers about your proposal? Um, each of you can each make a short remark if you like. Um, I would say that the current corporate options that are being provided here, Comcast um, solutions where they're providing uh, special devices, special hotspots into the home, those are insufficient uh, for a, a gamut of reasons. Um, they have data caps. They are more expensive than they need to be. They um, may not necessarily follow the NIST framework for cybersecurity. And so these individuals may have vulnerabilities. Their security posture might be lowered by bringing them into their home. And, you know, all of this is to um, you know, I, I have hope that municipalities being like more dynamic on the regular side, uh, regulatory side than, you know, state or federal uh, regulators will take this into account and really make the push to deal with the issues that are born from racism uh, to deal with the ongoing issue, the digital divide. Thank you. And Justin, if you wanted to make a final remark, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I would, um, I would just say that, uh, again, this is an issue that, um, uh, you know, we need to start somewhere, we need to act, um, we need to act as aggressively as possible on this. So, um, again, this is a, um, 
this initiative, it's a, some people would consider it radical, but I say this is exactly what is needed because there's just too many of us that we're losing out on job opportunities, we're missing out on uh, opportunities, connections with family and friends because we're missing out on the internet. So this is, um, you know, we need to, uh, we need to make sure that we're as thorough as possible, including everybody. Which is, Absolutely. Thank you both so much for talking about your proposal or solution, the winner. Um, we really appreciate you guys participating and participating today and talking about it and really excited about the solution. And I'm, I'm hoping the right people will hear about it and get some of this stuff put into play, um, get it implemented in the real world. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move on to uh, team five. Um, and it's basically going to cover the uh, similar format that we just covered, you know, question wise and discussion. Um, but just go ahead and remind the audience uh, who you are, real quick, two of you. Hey guys. Um, so, Team Five is me and Noha. And so, um, with the two of you, what drew, by the way, am I, I think I'm successfully sharing. Oh, maybe not yet. It's going to pull up. Well, let's see, did you guys have a one pager? You did. There we go. Do you guys see the one pager now? Yeah. Maybe. Cool. All right. I'm excited. There's there's A, B happening here. Um, OK, so uh, with the two of you, what drew you guys to technology policy? OK, I'll go ahead. Uh, so I'm, uh, um, I work in uh, ICT field. I'm a cloud engineer in at Dell Technologies. And I'm uh, involved in internet governance spaces uh, on the global and regional levels. And I personally believe that uh, discussions about uh, public tech policy should be open and inclusive for everyone. Absolutely. No what is your background? Yeah. And Jessica, what drew you? Uh, so I am also a software engineer um, for work in like engineering in that space. Um, but I've been interested in kind of like tech and also AI policy for uh, several years now. So I've also been following the space and was looking for ways to get more involved. And with each of you, um, what specifically drew you to the technology policy hackathon, this inaugural hackathon of ours that all happened virtually? <laughs> Yeah, a, a friend of mine had shared the, the opportunity uh, via mailing list, so I didn't hesitate to, to apply. And yeah, I also found it off a mailing list slash email newsletter. I also get like tons of newsletters. Um, and I actually applied late, but was able to get in and get a spot on the team. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and dive in and uh, go ahead and do sort of a quick overview of uh, what your solution is, uh, which tied for runner up um, as you know, runner up for the hackathon. So yeah, go ahead and give it a shot. <laughs> okay, I was, um, I was really surprised to, to know that we have many similarities with the team seven. Um, so we, the drive was mainly the same, like uh, closing the digital divide, especially that we need to, the internet access now more than ever. Um, so it's uh, the, our solution is a community-based solution. Um, we um, were aiming to use uh, libraries in local communities as nodes to create a mesh network as well and extend their uh, uh, Wi-Fi connection to the surroundings so the internet users around these libraries can, can utilize it, especially it's for free. And um, it's also like creating a partnership between uh, uh, the private sector and um, and the public sector as well. Uh, so the internet users can benefit from this partnership. Jessica, if you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, so I was, yeah, I was also pretty surprised at how similar proposals were because we hadn't, we didn't really have any like communication while we were actually working on the hackathon. Um, yeah. So it's good to see that we were kind of like thinking along the same lines in that sense. Um, yeah, I'll just add that like our proposal, we wanted a community-based approach because we really wanted to kind of leverage existing resources. 
Um, so um, while we were doing research, it seemed like a lot of the proposals for closing the digital divide are like very top down oriented or rely on buy-in at like a very high like federal level, um, state level, or like from the broadband corporations themselves. So we wanted to focus on resources that already existed in the community and try to come up with something um, like hyper local in a sense. Um, Sam, I know earlier you mentioned like NYC Mesh. So that was one of the resources we looked at. We were looking into um, just like community mesh organizations and looking for opportunities to kind of connect um, public institutions like libraries with those organizations that already exist. Um, so hence the title of our proposal. Awesome. Um, and so, you know, you guys sort of already laid out sort of who needs to be involved in order to execute your solution. Um, but do you have a rough idea how much your solution would cost and who would be paying the bill? Yeah, I think um, Sam already mentioned a figure. So this is, I guess, a problem with our proposals being very similar. <laughs> Um, so I uh, found a resource for NYC Mesh that mentioned um, something along the lines of like, it was under $10,000. Sorry, I don't remember the exact figure. I have to like go look from, looking for the resource again. It's been several months. Fair enough. <laughs> um, yeah. For kind of like an initial investment um, in the community. That's like a very, I know that's a very broad spectrum, but um, we were also looking into funding for, for libraries. Um, and the part of the idea was that the community networks wouldn't, necessarily have to bear all of the costs themselves or like raise money within the community, although that was one other option. Um, so looking at like how library funding could be used to support um, community efforts. And then like Noha mentioned, um, public private partnerships. Um, so either um, companies could donate things like routing equipment or um, one thing we saw in our research of community networks was that um, businesses would help sponsor they would like sponsor a node basically, or like allow their space or their roof to be used um, oh, like as that. a node in the network. Um, and that way it involves more in the community versus just the people who are most in need, which I think is like one, one important factor for a community-based approach. You wanna get more people on board versus people really pushing from, for like something that they need and need to ask for. Absolutely. Um, and so you guys, sort of briefly mentioned your background coming into this. Um, is your solution one that, you know, in your ideal universe, you would want to be involved in executing or is it more you're putting it out there and hoping that people already involved in the field will take it from here? I, um, I'm not based in the US, so <laughs> I don't know how can I, I can be involved in this, but um, I would I would love to to like, deeper how this can be replicated in other communities in other regions. For sure. Yeah, I guess um, we like, I would say our team didn't have a lot of direct policy experience. We were kind of coming to this brand new. Um, but I think personally, it would be something that I would like to get involved in. I don't know, maybe on the like the negotiating the partnership level, but um, as we were doing research into these community networks, I think that was something that I was personally interested in learning a lot more about um, just kind of like, we can call them like backdoor approaches to kind of like building your own, um, providing your own broadband. Um, so that was something that I would definitely be interested in looking into in the future. Um, but as for like implementation of our idea, um, I'd say we kind of like came up with the idea, but unlike team five, we didn't really start looking like contacting people to see um, necessarily who would be interested in implementing it. Totally fair. Um, so we're going to have to move on shortly, but I'll go ahead and you know, give you guys you know, that same last question. If nothing else, what do you hope the audience remembers about your proposal? Keeping in mind that this will be posted, like the recording will be posted. So like audience down the line will also be listening to this and yeah, kind of give them a takeaway. <laughs> I guess I push for funding for your local library, like support library resources and support resources in your community that are widely accessible to people and advocate for those. Yes. Um, um, I, what I love about our solution, it's uh, that it's a, uh, it's a bottom up. Um, it's following the bottom up approach. And uh, I would prefer everyone to, to look at, at issues from this perspective, like 
uh, utilizing the resources that you have and um, come up with creative solutions to like creative and quick solutions to, to resolve these issues. Thank you both so much. I, I really appreciate you guys going through the solution with me and talking it out. Um, we're going to move on to our final team who was, they were also tied for runner up. Uh, so that's team eight. You guys wanna go ahead and introduce yourselves again. Hi, I'm Anya. And I'm Lama. And so what drew each of you to technology policy generally? Yeah, I think in general, um, I've been really interested in technology policy because of its potential for social impact. Um, so just to give an example, um, I'm a student and so my focus is really on development and growth and to know that technology is shaping every part of our international arena is really important. And so my study of technology has been primarily motivated by an, um, a need to understand how it can help um, in terms of growth and development, international affairs, and student and I've kind of shaped my entire academic journey just based on the intersections of policy law and technology. Um, that I'm is so an interdisciplinary cool. major. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm an interdisciplinary major focused in calm law, econ, and government. Um, and then as I was watching the Mark Zuckerberg hearings, because I go to school in DC, I was like, no one understands technology. Like there needs to be someone there to kind of act as a middle ground person. So I went ahead and minored in computer science and information systems. And ever since then, I've been trying to elevate my knowledge in tech policy, cyber policy, al algorithmic bias, and civic tech. And here I am. That's so cool. <laughs> I was gonna say you're like inspirational for me. I feel like it, this. I've tried to do a similar thing. I'm a little bit younger for than Llama for context for everybody, and that's also sort of what I'm doing too. And trying to like, I have an interdisciplinary major and tried to take computer science this semester. So she is an inspiration to me. Just FYI. <laughs> yeah, those are. Uh... I mean, I suppose I could have cobbled together a major kind of like that, but I did not get started in all of this as early as undergrad, um, but I will throw out a shameless plug. I've been running a blog for a few years called Tech Talk Translated, which focuses on the intersection of law and policy and technology. So when you were describing that, I'm like, oh, that's what I write about for fun. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, so back to your solution. Sorry, I was distracted by how cool you guys are. Um, so what brought you guys to the hackathon? I think for me, I think it was one of my professors who reached out to me and he said, you'd be really, really interested in this. You'd be a perfect Aww. fit. Please apply. Yeah. Um, he actually, I took a seminar with him in my freshman year. Um, and he was the one who first introduced me to the importance of understanding data and technology. Um, and um, since then, I've been doing research with him. Um, Very and cool. Until my senior year. So that's who introduced me to the hackathon. That's awesome. Um, so this is actually my second uh, policy hackathon related to technology. Ooh. Um, yeah, so over the summer, um, I was selected to be a competitor um, on the PPIA's Carnegie Mellon hackathon. It was focused on civic tech and police reform. And we kind of have a Facebook group. And I think one of the attendees works at ILPF and she posted the hackathon on the Facebook group. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. And yeah. Awesome. I'm like also taking like mental notes for like, okay, which of our ways of sending information out are like actually working? Sounds like our email list is like on point and everyone's getting the email list. So I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so let's go ahead and dive into your solution. I'm gonna attempt to share your one pager. Here we go. Yes, it's very, it's, it's, if somebody here knows what they're doing graphics wise is uh, that's all I have to say in the matter. See if I can zoom it out such that it's all there. Do you guys see that? I think that works. And yeah, all credit to Llama on graphics. She's incredible. It's on I point. also run a blog. I also <laughs> run a blog on Tumblr, so graphics are my thing. <laughs> there you go. All right. Yeah, I'm just merely using WordPress and you can go down WordPress holes real fast. Um, so yeah, so your solution. 
Go ahead and tell us what it is. Yeah, so I think our solution was really focused on broadband access in prisons. Actually, one of our team members brought up this topic to us, um, and we all thought it was an excellent idea. Um, he had a lot of personal experience um, working in the criminal justice system and was really passionate about it. So he really introduced that topic to us. And from there, we started brainstorming ideas um, of how broadband access in prisons could um, potentially um, level the playing field level level the playing field excuse me and help um, stay engaged with emerging tech um, i'll also add that we really wanted to focus on the life of incarcerated people once they leave prison there's absolutely no support for them whatsoever um, and a lot of them who have been incarcerated for 20 plus years they walk into a world and suddenly everyone has crazy touchscreen devices some of them have never seen these kind of devices ever before and so because our world is so digitally integrated online it's really important that we provide these digital skills so that when they go out into the world they at least have some kind of idea of like how the world is working um, and that also helps to reduce recidivism rates and ultimately um, overall it reduces funds for people from people's taxes within prison systems and also allows prisoners to actually have a life outside. Yeah, just to add off of that, I think one thing that's really important to know is that I feel like we all take, take, all take for granted sometimes that we have access to information 24 seven whenever we want, but that's certainly not the case for those in the criminal justice system. And so the ability to even just know what's happening in their communities and also learn new skills on the internet is a huge, huge deal. Um, and can definitely help after um, their time in prison. So when I was reviewing uh, you guys' solution, I was particularly impressed by, um, you know, there's all sorts of different, there's a diversity of communities that are um, very affected by the digital divide and incarcerated folks and folks post-incarceration is absolutely one of them, but not one of them that I had really previously thought about. Um, so I think you mentioned it briefly, but if you wanted to sort of expand a little bit on what um, inspired you to sort of address this very this community that absolutely needs the attention, but I feel like often doesn't get the attention that they need. Yeah, I think for us, it was um, after a team member, I think you can see it um, on, the, on the graphic, but I think it's Dondi who introduced it to us. Um, and after we started researching, we really realized that this wasn't a place that a lot of policymakers, um, lawyers, and technologists were thinking about. Um, and that made it even more urgent for us to see if we could implement a solution and make technology more accessible. Um, after we started researching it more and more, we realized that this could have not only a short-term, but a long-term impact in terms of outcomes. And that was really important to us. We want our solution ultimately to be sustainable. Um, and we thought that this was it. Uh, also, given all the recent protests over the summer, I personally have been doing a lot of reading about the future of rehabilitation and um, criminal justice reform. And obviously, Congress members, including our new president, talks about criminal justice reform, but doesn't really give specific policy solutions. And we thought that this small thing could be implemented on a larger scale um, and was a really good way to kind of act as digital rehabilitation, which isn't something that our criminal justice system really focuses on, we kind of really focus on pu punishment um, rather than what happens to incarcerated people after they leave. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's very timely for so many reasons, including, as you said, um, sort of the protests and the, the push for major reform that finally happened this last summer. Um, so do you guys have a rough idea of how much your solution would cost and who would be paying the bill? Yeah, so I actually ended up taking our policy idea later on and making it more specific to New York City, um, the, to the New York City prison population for a fellowship app. Um, and overall, because families still have to pay for cell phone usage in order to talk to their family members who are incarcerated, it will save them about $8 million. Um, wow. And then funding will also come from public-private partnerships. Um, and that also allows us to reduce the costs on taxpayers and also um, implement like cybersecurity and privacy regulations so that people aren't misusing prisoners' data. Um, and 
I don't know if Ani, you have some more things to add. No, I think that's great. I think you pretty much covered it. Um, I think one other important thing that we noted um, in our presentation was that um, often there's illicit or unrestricted internet access in prisons, um, which can often lead to other criminal enterprises, and that's often like associated with financial transactions. So making this accessible, and legal, and available would definitely mitigate that. Um, so just wanted to add that in since it also is financial, but yeah. Oh, and I'll also add that in the beginning of our paper, we kind of had two ideas. So the first idea was actually like legalizing internet connected devices in prisons because technically you're not allowed to have a cell phone coming in and incarcerated people spend about $1 per minute on the phone and giving people access to cell phones period allows them to reduce that cost barrier so that they can also stay connected with their families because a lot of people when they leave prison they don't have any kind of social network because they haven't spoken to their families in so long so that actually helps build communities so that when they leave they have they actually have a support system waiting for them so i'm curious it's sort of a follow-up question and it's totally okay if you don't know the answer to this offhand um you mentioned that uh incarcerated persons aren't allowed to have cell phones is that like a federal law? Is it policy within prison? Like, where does the rule come from and how precisely is the notion of cell phone defined in that? I think it's a state by state cases. Um, I know recently New York has completely um, gotten rid of like the price related to actually having to like call people through the cell phones. But I think you have to purchase like a a cell phone provided by the prison. Um, I'm not sure that there are any prison communities in the US that actually allow people to bring in their technologies to begin with. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure they have policy reasons behind it, but uh, they, are they are probably policies that it's about time were revisited and the pros and cons were reconsidered. Um, so yeah, and uh, Llama, did I, did I say that right? Um, yeah, you're good. Okay, I was concerned. Um, you mentioned that you sort of revamped a little bit your policy uh, in putting together an application for a fellowship. So that sounds to me like you are interested in executing your plan rather than uh, turning it over to those already in the field. Uh, if you wanna talk a little bit more about that, here's your opportunity. <laughs> yeah, so I can talk a little bit about my the fellowship app that I did so I kind of made it so New York City currently has um, their internet master plan and it's basically uh, I think a five to ten year plan on enhancing uh, statewide broadband and when I was reading it it was all really great but they didn't talk about providing broadband access to the prison population so as my policy proposal I was like hey don't forget about the prison population because when we talk about universal broadband we mean all people and incarcerated people are people um, and so basically when I was talking about um, funding I mentioned how some of the funds within the universal broadband plan can be extended to the prison population because the master plan is working with a lot of private companies to reduce the cost on taxpayers. And we had mentioned that in our policy proposal. So I connected the lines together there. And is that application still pending or how, how did that turn out? Yeah, so <laughs> sadly I didn't get into the urban fellows program. Um, I think it's because Given COVID, a lot of graduate students are also applying, so it's very, very competitive. Um, and I don't have as much experience as a lot of some of the other applicants in public service. But never fear, um, I'm still <laughs> applying to different research um, fellowships and entry level job positions. So we will see. And if someone who was listening to this wanted to track you down, I assume you're on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, and Anya, if you wanted to address, you know, are you also um, interested in executing the plan that you guys came up with or sort of what your take is on that? I would potentially be interested. However, I feel like it's important to have 
um, if we were to implement to have experts in different parts of the field, one thing that's really important for me is to realize that we have like interdisciplinary perspectives and also ask the communities with which we could potentially be involved with. Um, I think as Lama mentioned, a lot of these communities are disproportionately um, people of color and low income people and that causes a lot of um, intersectional um, potential solutions and policies that would arise and I think it's really important to address those so if we were to um, combat this policy solution in the best way that we could I would really like to interact and learn from legal experts experts in the criminal justice system and especially prisoners that we would be interacting with absolutely good to have all the stakeholders involved when trying to put forth a community solution um, so yeah I guess we'll sort of wrap up the um, each team bit with you know, if nothing else, what do you each hope the audience remembers from your proposal? Um, I will say when enacting policy, don't forget about how it's going to affect um, incarcerated people. Oftentimes, we tend to forget that they exist. And I think that's something that we need to stop doing. Um, and also the idea of abolishing the box. Um, when incarcerated people apply for jobs, oftentimes that they, ha they have to reveal that they were formerly incarcerated and that sometimes acts as a barrier for them to get employment. And I think helping to reduce recidivism is a community-wide effort. And I think if we work together to eliminate the stigma, we can very much change the lives of a lot of people. Yeah, I definitely agree with Lama on eliminating the stigma. I mean, like we've been touching on, this issue is very intersectional and very multifaceted. Um, one thing that I want um, people who are watching to know is to understand that this issue, like many issues, um, is intersectional multifaceted, meaning that we need to understand it from multiple perspectives. And also just to know that um, our solution, I was really proud of because it has both short-term and long-term benefits. It's important not to just have a quick policy fix um, through technology and important to understand that any long-term solution needs to be sustainable and helpful for the communities that serves. Absolutely, thank you both. Uh, so I wanted at this point to open things up to the audience for any questions the audience might have. Um, I'm not totally sure how the audience works in this thing, if we just don't see them or if they're just not there. Um, John might be able to state whether there's any question. Oh, let's see, is there a question coming up? Oh, here we go. We do have a question. Uh, so I will answer live. That's what we're going to do. Okay. So we did get a question. Team seven, I was intrigued with the idea of involving the community in maintaining the mesh. Were you also looking to have volunteers help with showing others how to use the internet? If so, how might you operationalize volunteering? Sure. Uh, I can speak to that. Uh, so there are sort of two components, I think, to answer that question. The first one, um, what we're looking for are not volunteers, but actually municipally funded uh, local residents who use the mesh network to act as stewards for the networks. These are individuals who would be trained at community college programs that exist already. They would be paid by the city to act as basically network engineers who maintain this infrastructure. This creates jobs in these underserved communities, as well as keeping the like maintenance uh, a community effort. Um, insofar as volunteering for education goes, these these efforts already exist. So uh, I believe we touch on uh, the like public libraries that provide educational services. Again, community colleges provide these services, um, and so you know part part of this budget, uh, particularly coming from the federal side, could be to bolster the existing curriculum that exists and sort of um, integrate them better so that uh, different skill levels can be provided, different types of information and different types of educational uh, support. And Justin, if you wanted to also comment on that. Um, no, that was, uh, I think we covered all the, all the main points there. Just uh, essentially, um the, the the idea that um we're, we're gonna have to bring in some outside 
individuals to start things up, of course, but the idea was really to just have maybe one or two um, outside individuals assisting an entire, an entire community. Um, this, the idea of having the mesh networks, it won't work unless it is uh, primarily done by the community. So just kind of having that interface with the, with the one individual, um, uh, oh, you know, having them on access to, um, um, you know, through phone or email, just, uh, but otherwise um, making sure that, I apologize, my, my um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just making sure that we have that, that community support with with uh, with at least um, a couple individuals from the outside. That's awesome. Thank you both so much. Um, and thank you, anonymous attendee, for your question. Uh, so let's see, uh, yeah, questions are open. It looks like there is the ability to, to submit questions to the Q&A. So I'll leave that open and running for a bit right now. Um, there's no more questions coming in from there. So I'm definitely not to open up between the panelists. Um, I am curious to, I think some of you said you did not talk during the hackathon kind of outside your teams. I do know there was a Slack that I think probably made it possible if you wanted to. Um, so I was curious if any of you guys you know, were using the Slack to chat with, chat with other folks during the hackathon. Uh, I think I think I was the one that mentioned that. Um, I'd say um, yes. I guess none of us really discussed our solutions with other teams. I don't know if anybody here was like chatting about the uh, <laughs> solution with other teams, um, which is kind of like why we were surprised that we had like independently generated two similar proposals. Um, but I think like for our team, it was also we were also um, in four different time zones, so it was a uh, like Noah mentioned she's. In Cairo, so um, that is challenging. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty challenging in that front. So we were kind of heads down there. Definitely added some uh, some extra elements to the equation. Um, so I'm curious if you guys have you know now that you've heard about each other's solutions, uh, whether you have any questions for each other. I'm definitely open to that. No, no questions for each other. Hi. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on uh, the solution of Team 8. Um, girls, I would like to congratulate you. It's, um, I'm very amazed by your solution and all the details in it. Good job. Ted, thank you. I was going to say, I have been following the idea of uh, community-based broadband for a really long time, especially, I think someone mentioned Chattanooga, and I think it's a brilliant example, and I hope Moving forward, the U.S. will model the same across the entire country. Yeah, I would definitely love to see all of your solutions put into play. Um, I seem to have, uh, um, I feel like I've caught recently that there's been more of a push and more financing. Oh, we do have, how, so we have a, another question from an anonymous attendee, I'll do the answer live, but how long was the virtual hackathon? Um, so I can answer this. It opened on a Friday and I believe y'all solutions were due by like noon that Sunday. Um, you guys can correct me, I'm getting lots of nods. So, okay, I'm remembering correctly. Um, so yeah, but if, you know, you guys wanna talk a little bit more about how that timing felt, um, I you know, didn't take part in this hackathon, but I was actually the only person on the committee that put together the hackathon that had participated in hackathons prior to this hackathon. Uh, and so while they did kind of put out the timeline, I also confirmed like, yes, other hackathons have used this timeline and it is doable and it is not completely crazy. Um, but I am curious to hear about um, sort of y'all's personal experiences. You know, we have a few more minutes, if you guys, you know, each want to say something short about kind of what it was like, the time frame. Well, for me, it was, I oh. think it was right around, oh, was someone talking? Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think it was right around Thanksgiving. So usually by that time, a lot of work is due. So I really had to make sure that all my assignments were in before I could like dedicate three whole days 
to the hackathon so it was a lot of like zoom calls midnight slack messages um and pretty much like dividing and conquering work um two of our group members actually couldn't like continue with the hackathon because things came up which is like what happens obviously so i think it was a really good learning experience to kind of be like oh in certain situations things can come up and we just kind of have to adapt and i think that's like the entire COVID experience uh, um yes. and I think we had a lot of fun and regardless of the time crunch, I think it made us more willing to actually dedicate time to our project. Awesome. I think Jessica had comments she was going to make. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just wanted to say that compared to the, the um, hackathons I did as a student, which were like not policy hackathons, they were like coding hackathons, the, the timeline felt very generous because <laughs> it was room to sleep. Um, like there, it felt like because normally there's kind of like an expectation that you'll like be up all night or pull at least one all nighter. So we talked like, about that as a committee. Like, We're no. like, <laughs> like, no, sorry. I'm glad y'all slept. Um, Can everyone yeah. confirm they slept? <laughs> we gave you the time during the time. Okay, good. But I mean, I want to give major props to Noha for staying up really late several nights just because of, like I mentioned, the time zones. Um, but yeah, it was really enjoyable, I think, to, to be able to work with a team um, on an interesting problem. A couple more minutes if anyone else wanted to comment on their specific experience with the timeline. Yeah, it, it was fine for me, although I, I worked during the weekend, but I guess it was fine. The, the challenging part was that, um, yeah, the time zones and uh, <laughs> also that I'm, I'm, I'm not based in the US. So I was like, I was facing so many <laughs> knowledge gaps, I don't know. Um, I was afraid to be, uh, lacking behind, but um, uh, I would like to thank Jessica and, and the girls and our team. We were all an all women team, a powerful team. So I would, uh, I would like to thank them all. Thank you. Yeah, it's really wonderful to hear how, you know, well you guys came together and how you got to, you know. I, did any of you guys know each other going in to the hackathon? No? Okay, so everybody met during this. So. That's one of my favorite parts about hackathons is, you know, you, you're meeting people for the first time and then doing this really intense project with them. Like you, you learn a lot about someone real quick when you're sort of in that environment. Um, so because this is a Zoom call, we're required to have my cat vomit before the end. So this is Bella and she she's very excited to be part of this. <laughs> All right, she, uh, she jumped out of my hands and, and cause problem. But anyway, she says hello, and she's a required part of the Zoom experience. Um, so yeah, it looks like we're coming up on sort of the end of our timing. So I just wanted to thank all the panelists for making the time to come and present your solutions. I really appreciate it. The Internet Law and Policy Foundry really appreciates your time and all of you know, your really exciting solutions. We're really hoping that they'll be able to be implemented um, in, you know, the communities where they are needed and we can really address this digital divide issue. Um, not sure if John or Matt had any final points they wanted to make. Yeah, I'll do a, fi a final blurb that I, need, that I need to say, but um, Matt, if there's anything you'd like to um, add, I'd certainly like to leave the floor open for you first. No, thanks so much, uh, Lauren, for moderating and, and everyone for participating. Absolutely, my pleasure. All right, yeah, once again, thank, or yeah, thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you very much um, all, or to um, all of our panelists. Thank you to our attendees, and thank you, Matt, for the point of contact and helping to put this together. Um, this, this webinar was hosted by the Internet Law and Policy Foundry, as you know, and also by the ST Global Consortium, which is a, a graduate student-run um, consortium of, or a graduate, graduate student-run intercollegiate organization, which organizes learning center events for early career scholars and practitioners in the social and policy studies of science and technology. Um, SD Global is a registered 501c nonprofit com comprised of dues-paying member universities, including Arizona State University, who also supported us by providing the digital infrastructure for this webinar, Georgetown University, George Washington University, the University of Virginia, Virginia Tech, and the University of Maryland College Park. Um, we also have mission partners at the Pugst, or at uh, Student Pugwash USA um, and at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Our next webinar will be late this month. Um, it'll be on um, digital labor, 
Um, and our annual conference is coming up in mid-April and registrations are still open for that. So please uh, head, on, head on over to our website at, at stglobal.org. That's www.stglobal.org to register for our conference. You, if you'd be interested in spending a couple of days in conversations like this, from hearing from some excited speakers, for some exciting speakers, um, I think that's about all I've got. So I will just once again, thank you to all our panelists. Thank you, Lauren, for uh, your excellent moderation. And thank you. see you all in the future. All right. Thank you all. Have a great day, everybody. You take care. Thank you. Hey, take can care. Can we take a group photo, maybe? <laughs>